All right. Well, thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Sonia Reyes, and I'm with the Office of Latino Affairs, and I'm super excited to be talking about this very, very important topic today. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of um, time. I'm just going to go ahead and introduce Malik and Max uh, with One Iowa. Uh, will you both mind um, introducing yourself and uh, tell us um, how long you've been at One Iowa and um, um, anything, anything else that you would like to share with the group? Uh, yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Malachi Mian Sosa. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Um, I've been at One Iowa for just a little over a month now, so about a month and a half. Um, so I'm super excited to be here today. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I'm the program coordinator at One Iowa. I guess I should tell you that as well. Yeah, I'm Max Moitz. I'm the program director at One Iowa. Um, my pronouns are they, them, A, A, and he, him, and L. And I, um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here today. I've been at One Iowa for um, a little over two years now, so it's been awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just excited to present to you all today. So thanks for having us. No, thank you for making time uh, from your busy schedules. I know that One Iowa provides a lot of services and education in, um, statewide. Um, will you mind sharing a little bit about One Iowa with us? Yeah, definitely. So One Iowa, uh, as Sonia mentioned, is the statewide LGBTQ advocacy organization. Um, we were actually founded in 2005 as a marriage equality organization. So back then there was not marriage equality here in the state of Iowa. Um, and we were founded to try to get um, uh, marriage equality here partially because there was marriage equality on the coasts and the belief was that if you could uh, start marriage equality in a midwest state um, kind of a middle leaning state that you could get it anywhere right and so um, when uh, we received marriage equality here in 2009 um, it was a watershed moment for uh, us LGBTQ Iowans but it also made us look inward on what are some other things that we could be doing to advocate for the rights of LGBTQ Iowans. So for the last 12 years, we've completely shifted gears um, and we focus on three main areas now. So the first is healthcare access. So making sure that LGBTQ individuals have access to inclusive um, LGBTQ friendly healthcare, which um, is not the case in a lot of parts of the state. Um, rural LGBTQ individuals, 41% uh, of rural LGBTQ individuals have been denied access to hospitals. So, you know, basic life-saving care, um, they're being denied access to that care. Um, additionally, um, the average trans Iowan has to drive an hour and a half to see an inclusive care provider. So there are these huge disparities and gaps in um, LGBTQ healthcare here in the state of Iowa. So we're trying to manage that and develop more connections with LGBTQ uh, friendly providers. Um, we also work on healthcare, or sorry, not healthcare. We do work on healthcare, obviously, but um, workplace culture as well. So making sure that workplaces are equipped to um, have LGBTQ employees um, and what that looks like and make sure that people are connected to those jobs. And then the third part of our work, which might be relevant to you all um, additionally, is um, we actually have an LGBTQ Leadership Institute. So if you know of any LGBTQ leaders, um, LGBTQ folks in your life that you think would be an amazing uh, member of our Leadership Institute, it's a four month long program. Um, it will be all virtual, which is really nice. So, you know, it makes it that much easier for folks to attend. Um, it's two hours every other week. So um, if you are interested in that, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my uh, email address is actually, I'm just gonna pop it into the chat. It's just useful to have moving forward, but that's another part of our strategic um, plan, our strategic focus is. So uh, that's kind of the work that we do. Um, and again, uh, applications are open for Leadership Institute. So if there's anyone you think would be amazing, please connect them with us because it's gonna be it's gonna be an awesome year. So, um, but yeah, those are some of the things that we do. Um, when when it comes to our like larger programming pieces, we've got the Leadership Institute, but we also have two health and wellness conferences, one of which is coming up on April 10th and 11th. So if you're interested in participating or tabling for that, again, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd love to connect with you. Um, and then we also have workplace culture summits as well as an older adults conference. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a really awesome year of programming. We hope that we can see you all there. Um, but that's just a little bit about what we do as an organization.
Thank you so much, Max. And um, I just wanted to um, really quick share one of the one of the main reasons why we are having um, this webinar about this specific topic is because we have a lot of uh, new immigrants in the state of Iowa who identify as LGBTQIA, and um, the, there's already a lot of barriers that our Latino community has um, in the state, depending on their immigration status, depending on um, where they are, if they're more rural areas. But if you tackle on top of that, uh, identifying as LGBTQ, the, um, the barriers just continue to grow. So it's uh, very, very important for all of us who work with the community to be aware of this, um, of how to better serve our LGBTQ um, individuals in Iowa. And um, about the, the Leadership Institute, I just want to say, if you know anyone um, that is LGBT, please send them the information. And, and I will send it out with when I send the recording. I will send out the link. Uh, because regardless of how long someone has been out, um, it is so important to get that, um, that support. I can tell you as someone who identifies as, as LGBTQ, it's really hard to work in an environment where you might be the only person who is LGBTQ or that is out. So uh, to find that support um, is very, very important for um, employment, uh, for retention. So with that being said, um, I would uh, let Max and Malachi um, start the presentation. Thank you both. Thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Oh, uh, can we have access to share our screen, Sonia? Perfect, thank you. Okay, I made your host. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Can everyone see that all right? Awesome. All right. Cool. Well, we are going to take you through a little LGBTQ 101 before we talk about pronouns. Because one thing we realize is that when we're talking about pronouns, we need to understand why pronouns are so important. So we're going to take you through the basics of that. And then we're going to head into a, a whole discussion and dialogue on pronouns and gender neutral language. So we always start our uh, programs, we always start our presentations with a land declaration. A land declaration is a, an acknowledgement of the stolen native and indigenous lands that we are on. Um, so here in Des Moines where I am, I'm on the stolen lands of the Lakota and Dakota, Meskwaki and Iowa tribes. If you're not familiar with what uh, stolen land uh, that you are on, I highly recommend you Google it. You can actually find it really, really easily. There's an amazing site um, that has you know, a map of the uh, United States and you can find that out there. But this is really only one piece, right? Acknowledging the stolen land that we're on is only one very small piece of Native and Indigenous liberation. Um, so I also highly recommend that you get um, connected with Native and Indigenous organizations like Great Plains Action Society and that you um, give generously to those organizations as well and keep learning and keep um, listening to Native and Indigenous voices. Give me one second here. There's some people that are trying to join, so I'll let them in real quick as we keep continuing here. Perfect. Cool. So before we keep going here, uh, just talking about our group agreements. Um, so first, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas if you've never been to Vegas or um, aren't familiar with this term. Uh, quickly, what that means for you all is um, personal narratives that are shared today. We want to want to truly keep confidential. Um, so one way that Max uh, always explains this is lessons leave the room, but stories stay. Um, this is central and key to um, our presentation today. Um, so if anyone has uh, any stories that are shared, they stay here today, but lessons can always leave with you. Um, then there is no such thing as a silly question. Um, we're going to be covering a wide variety of topics today, so don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, drop them either in the chat, or um, if you want, you can speak up as well. But also, we're going to assume that all your questions have good intent. Um, 
obviously we're going to assume that you don't want to hurt anyone with your question, but also it's important to understand um, the impact or honor the impact that you'll have on others by asking these questions. Um, but the good news is we are here as a resource for you. So truly do ask those questions if you have them. Um, also, you don't have to be an expert on the LGBTQ community to treat people with respect and dignity. Um, that is key today, um, treating others with respect and dignity. Um, all you truly do need uh, today is just some basic information, which we're going to be giving you, and then a willingness to learn from others. And give me one second, sorry, there's more people coming in here that I wanna make sure get in. I'm wondering, can I make you a co-host, Sonia? Um, okay. We'll see if that works for now. <laughs> um, then talking about the LGBT. So first, uh, the LGB stands for lesbian, gay, or bisexual. A lesbian is typically a woman who is attracted to another woman. Gay is typically a man who is attracted to a man, um, but this can also be used as an umbrella term. So for example, um, Ellen DeGeneres uses the term gay to identify um, even though she is a woman attracted to women. Um, then talking about bisexual, that is someone who is attracted to two or more genders. Um, so those first three letters there are all sexual orientation, uh, which means those are people attracted to someone. Um, and then talking about the T, which is gender identity, uh, T standing for trans or transgender. Um, this is typically, identi this identifies someone who um, has a gender expression or expresses their gender um, or identifies as a gender different from the sex that they were assigned at birth. And we will get into that as well further on here. Um, one thing that can be kind of confusing um, that's really important is to understand the difference between sexual orientation. So one thing that you can keep in mind is that sexual orientation is who you go on a date with and gender identity is who you go on a date as. So I always try to keep that in mind if I'm getting like confused or get that mixed up. And then talking about the Q, which is sexual orientation and or gender identity. So Q can mean queer or questioning. Um, so queer can be another umbrella term um, for our community, um, but also it's important to understand that queer is a term that has been reclaimed by our community. So we should never just call someone queer or um, assume that someone is queer. Uh, that is a term that uh, people choose to identify as. So it's always important to understand that uh, that term is you typically only use for our community, by our community. But if someone identifies as queer, and then usually is okay to also identify them as queer. So if I tell you I'm a queer man, you can also say, okay, Malika is a queer man. Um, oh, sorry here. I don't know if you can see this chat that's in the middle of my screen. Oh my goodness. All right. And then also talking about the questioning side of things. Questioning can mean they're questioning sexual orientation and or gender identity. It's super important to notice and or there. Um, so I can be questioning my sexual orientation if I'm sexually attracted to men or women, but also what I identify as, if I identify as a man or a woman or somewhere outside of the binary. And then really nailing down that sexual orientation definition, um, the enduring pattern of romantic and or sexual attractions to other persons. Um, so then we've already hit on all of these. I'm hoping we're all familiar with what straight or heterosexual means. Um, I've already, we've already identified lesbian, gay, and bisexual, but then talking about pansexual, which is someone who is attracted to another regardless of gender. Um, so it's important there that uh, the term bisexual and pansexual can be used interchangeably um, as pansexual or bisexual does mean attracted to two or more genders. Um, then I'm talking about asexuality. Asexuality is someone who has no romantic or sexual attraction to another. Um, and it's super important here to notice that all of these terms are not choices. Um, they are what someone feels and identifies as. Um, so for example, asexuality is not a choice. It is not celibacy. It's not choosing to re refrain from sex or romantic attraction. It's just that they can't experience or, or do not experience it. 
thing I want to just uh, quickly note is that if you have any questions that pop up, Sonia mentioned this earlier, but I don't think everyone was here yet, please pop those into the chat. Um, we've got a lot of material, so it's kind of hard to unmute yourself, get a word in edgewise, but if you pop it into the chat, you can also direct message either one of us. Um, I, since I'll be uh, mainly moderating, you can direct message me whatever questions you have and I can shout them out to Malachi. Um, uh, and you can always like do that direct message as well so that people don't see your question. So if you are a little bit like hesitant to ask a question or something like that, like please feel free to just uh, direct message us uh, that way, um, you know, that's just between the two of us. Um, or if, if you don't mind, if other people see your question, just pop it into the chat. Um, uh, and so that way we can answer those as you go, go along. So thanks. And we have one question that was a message to me and it says, what about the term queen? I have heard it from men and women. I, so what do you guys say? Yeah, so queen typically uh, is used to refer to um, drag queens. Um, and also it's used as um, typically a term that our community uses to like identify one another, um, typically just people who are co close friends, things like that. But it's also important to understand that um, queen is a gender term sometimes. So some people will uh, not like to be referred to as queen, um, but it is typically found in the drag community specifically. I don't know if you have anything else to add on that one, Max. No? Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Um, usually when we're referring to queen in the LGBTQ community, it's for, yeah, a drag performer, a drag queen. Um, but yeah, like Malachi said, sometimes um, we might refer to each other as queen as like a way of uplifting or um, affirming a person as well. So it's not necessarily like a um, super rigid identity, but rather like uh, a term of endearment or a way of speaking about drag performers. Um, but again, just kind of reiterating our sexual orientation piece, it is not a choice, it is not an illness or emotional problem, it, it cannot be changed through therapeutic methods such as conversion therapy. Um, there's a variety of determining factors which usually occur at a very early age, so there's no easy way to pinpoint if someone will identify within the LGBTQ community or be either gay, lesbian, um, bisexual, pan, all those sexual orientations that we talked about. But it's also important to note that this can be different from sexual behavior. So I may be a gay identifying man or um, be a man in my 60s who is married to a woman and has had children, but then just coming to terms with the fact that I am gay identifying. So um, gay men can have sex with women um, and vice versa there or um, anywhere outside of the binary, it's important to note. Um, but truly uh, sexual orientation is how someone identifies with themselves. Um, then this is super important today as we're going to be hitting on pronouns, talking about the difference between sex and gender. Sex refers to typically what's going on inside the body biologically, hormones, chromosomes, genitalia, and reproductive anatomy. Gender is also a set of um, social, physical, psychological, and emotional traits. These are all happening outside of the body. Um, these are often influenced by societal expectations. So um, typically society defining what it means to be feminine, masculine, androgynous, and other, um, or other. These are not the same um, for any particular individual. Um, so uh, a man can may dress or speak and behave in a feminine manner or vice versa, or a woman may, may dress or speak in a masculine manner. Um, so it's important to note that um, these don't go hand in hand. Another good thing, another way if you're like trying to get your mind um, around the difference between sex and gender is that sex is literally just what's happening in the body. That's all it is. Um, so whereas like dolphins possess sex and flowers possess sex and bumblebees possess sex, um, humans possess both sex and gender, right? So if sex is what's happening in the body, gender is what's happening all around us, and it has everything to do with the society that we live in, right? So trying to keep those two things a little bit more separate and like divorce them from each other can be really helpful because uh, it makes the, the difference between the two very clear. Um, and if we think about, you know, the United States in 2021, one like huge phenomenon that conflates uh, sex and gender is uh, gender reveal parties, right? So when um, a, a parent is going to have a child, they have an ultrasound and they find out the sex characteristics of that baby, right? So it could be a variety of different sex characteristics that, that they find out about. Then they have a gender reveal party 
majority, right? They say it's like a boy or a girl, but you don't know the gender of that baby until that baby is born and like grows up, right? So um, when we assume that sex and gender are the same, that's where we run into issues when it comes to the trans community. And we'll talk more about that. So then talking about gender identity. Um, so this is the persistent internal sense of being a man or a woman or somewhere along the gender spectrum. Um, so we all have a gender identity. Um, for many of this, this matches the sex we were assigned at birth. Um, so this is the state of being cisgender. Um, so I was assigned male at birth and I identify as a man. Therefore, I am a cisgendered man or a cisgender man. Um, it's also important then to understand that for trans people, this is not the case. Um, so for example, a transgender woman uh, would be someone who was assigned male at birth, but has transitioned such as into a woman or identifies as a woman. Um, our gender identity um, does not always match or it can match our appearance, our bodies and others' perceptions of us. Um, so an easy way to wrap your head around this is the only thing defining me as a man is myself. Um, you may see me as a man, but um, that does not truly mean that I am a man. Um, I'm the one letting you know that I'm a man uh, through how I express myself um, as such. So um, anything else to add there, Max? Yeah, like Malachi had already mentioned, um, the only prerequisite for identifying as your gender identity is to identify as your gender identity. So this might seem like y'all might just be like, what are you talking about, Max? <laughs> but um, the only prerequisite for identifying as a woman is to identify as a woman, right? So you don't need to look a certain way, talk a certain way, act a certain way, or have certain sex characteristics to be a woman, right? Because gender and sex are really different. And this might seem really obvious to some of y'all, especially if you identify as cisgender. But when we talk about transgender people and non-binary people, that's when the rubber hits the road um, with this specific idea. So hang with us um, and, and we'll kind of connect that, that piece here in a moment. Um, and then kind of putting it into uh, a picture for you all, cisgender and transgender. So sex that you're assigned at birth, either male or female, and then the gender identity that you identify as. Um, obviously this Venn diagram or this graphic here doesn't accurately represent um, the majority of the population that identifies as cisgender or is cisgender, but this is just an example to help you wrap your head around um, what being cisgender is and what being transgender is. So um, if someone identifies um, differently from their sex assigned at birth, they would then fall into the outside of that middle section there being transgender. Can I um, just say something just for clarification? Um, so what I'm hearing is that um, just by looking at somebody, we cannot assume what their gender is. That just okay. because someone presents themselves masculine uh, or what we would call, you know, what a man would look like or a woman would look like, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's who, what they identify as, correct? Yeah, that Thank is you. very correct. Um, then talking about gender identity and Western colonialism. Again, this is essential when understanding uh, as we get into pronouns later on. Um, colonialization is the practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country and then exploiting it, um, typically e economically. Western colonialism is uh, the pretty much the same phenomenon, whereas various European nations explored, conquered, settled, and exploited large areas of the world. It's important to note that these areas were already explored, already settled by native and, and indigenous peoples. Um, so that goes all the way back to our land declaration, um, talking about the relation between colonialism. Then talking about gender expression. Uh, these are mannerisms, personal, personal traits, um, ways of dressing, et cetera, which serve to communicate um, a person's identity as they relate to gender and or gender roles. Um, this has nothing again, this again has nothing to do with our biological sex, which is all happening inside of us, not outside. Um, so two people with the same gender identity may have uh, different expressions of how they express that identity. Um, so uh, I may have a different way of expressing of, um, of what it means to be a man. Uh, so I could grow a beard or I could uh, have a clean shaven face, but another man may think that uh, to express his masculinity, he has to grow a beard. Um, so those are just two different examples. Um, but then talking about that, these may not always match others' expectations. Um, so if you think of a man, maybe you think of that beard 
bearded uh, person and who, someone who has a lot of muscles. But that does not mean that this person identifies as a man. Um, it's just our perceived perceptions of him, correct? Um, but then talking about the highly cultural sensitive um, uh, aspect of this, uh, based on where we are geographically and the time period, gender fluctuates, um, or these perceptions of gender fluctuate as well. Um, so the way I express being a man here in the US might be completely different from the way someone expresses being a man in um, an Asian culture or a European culture. Um, a good like example of this, I always like recommend thinking about the way that you express your gender, right? Because it like comes home, right? So um, think about if you're wearing perfume or cologne, do you have long or short hair? Are you sitting with your legs crossed or uncrossed? That can be an indication of gender in the United States, right? Um, one thing to think about when it comes to the way we might express our gender is that I, imagine with me, you can shut your eyes or you can keep them open. Imagine two cisgender women standing in front of you. So again, a cisgender woman is a person that was assigned female at birth and it grows up to identify as a woman into adulthood. So two cisgender women standing right next to each other. Um, the first might have a shaved head. Uh, she might be wearing a full face of makeup and a dress and combat boots. And then the woman standing next to her might have long hair, no makeup on, a pantsuit and a high heels, right? So these two people are both women, but one has long hair, one has a shaved head, one's wearing makeup, one isn't. One has on a dress, one has on a suit, and one's got on combat boots and one's got on high heels, right? So they're both expressing their gender really differently. So Imagine, if you will, that, uh, you know, we're post-COVID and it's safe to go to the gym again. So the woman with the shaved head decides to go to the gym tomorrow morning. And she, she goes to the gym really, really early. Uh, she goes at, you know, around 5 a.m. So she doesn't wear any makeup, right? Because it's way too early for that. Additionally, she decides to wear like her most comfortable baggy gray sweats because um, that is what she feels most like comfortable in um, when she's working out. So she finishes up at the gym and she stops by a coffee shop to pick up a coffee because, again, it's really early. And the barista takes a look at her when she walks in, sees that she's got a shaved head, no makeup on, and is wearing baggy gray sweats. And the barista makes a series of assumptions about her based on how she looks and says, oh, good morning, sir. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind with this. The first is that this is what we refer to as misgendering. So misgendering is using the wrong language to refer to a person, i.e. using sir to greet a woman. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that this doesn't make her any less of a woman because somebody didn't read her as a woman, right? Um, she's still a woman, um, and that fact is still true. And that's really important when we talk about, like, trans women and trans men. Like, just because you're not perceived as a woman or a man doesn't mean that you're not a woman or a man, right? Like Malachi said before, the only person that can say what your gender is is you. And then the third thing, and this is really, really important, is that this could have all been... Um, uh, like negated if the person, that barista, just simply hadn't assumed that person's gender, right? So Sonia clarified this earlier, making sure that you are not assuming the gender of the person that you're talking about is going to be so key. And we'll talk more about that, but it's really, really important to try not to gender people when you first meet them. Try not assuming uh, people's gender uh, when you interact with them until you know for sure what their gender identity is. Um, and, and there are a variety of ways to find that out, right? But um, that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, um, try to avoid making that assumption. That's going to be a really hard habit to build, of course, because uh, we're, you know, we're designed as humans to do that. Um, but then also trying to use gender neutral language when you can so that you're not accidentally misgendering someone um, through your language. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Gender expression is really tricky because it can feel, it can be really, really affirming, but it can also cause us to misgender people, which is something we want to avoid. And here in Iowa, we are, um, you know, we're Iowa nice. So we, a lot of people say, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Or here you go, ma'am. And, um, and that's one of the things where, one of some of the situations where people get misgendered because we're just making an assumption and calling someone ma'am or sir just by the way that they look. But we have no idea how they identify. Absolutely. Yes, give me one more second here. Sorry, another chat came up on my screen. Oh, perfect. Alrighty. 
So then talking about um, this gender expression that we've kind of hit on already, um, another fun way to wrap your head around this is to understand that um, typically when we're talking about gender reveal parties, um, people use blue for boys and pink for girls. Um, and it's super important to understand that this societal construct of colors um, going along with gender identities um, actually was completely different just a little under or a little over 100 years ago. Um, so typically pink was used for boys and blue was used for girls. Um, pink was more, uh, was seen as more of a decisive color, a stronger color, and therefore it was more suitable for a boy to be in pink, while blue was more delicate and dainty. Um, so again, it was seen as prettier for girls. Um, so that kind of can, that's how you can kind of wrap your head around the idea of the ever-changing um, societal expectations of what gender or how gender is expressed. And earlier when I mentioned um, gender reveal parties, a lot of the time with those parties, the way that we like reveal the gender is by like having blue or pink confetti come out of a cannon or having like a cake that you cut into be blue or pink on the inside, right? So like blue and pink are really, really strong gendered colors. And I think a lot of people are really surprised to find out that like blue and pink are like there's nothing like natural or unnatural about little girls wearing blue or little boys wearing pink or vice versa, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Um, just shouting out something that uh, came up in the chat. Um, it's also difficult if you've ever been in the military, sir or ma'am is ex expected during that time and a hard habit to break one out of the military. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, calling people sir or ma'am like comes from a good place, right? You want to like show respect, but ultimately um, you can like run into trouble, not just with, you um, uh, trans people, right, who don't identify as men or women, we'll talk about that more in a second, um, but it's also like a lot of people get misgendered that are cisgender, right, if, if there's a woman with really a really low voice or really short hair, um, she might get misgendered a lot, um, even though she doesn't identify as trans or non-binary, so it's something to keep in mind, but I definitely understand where it comes from, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the trans umbrella. So this encompasses anyone who like crosses over or challenges their society's uh, standards or expectations surrounding gender. Again, a transgender person is a person that doesn't identify with the sex that they were assigned at birth. So there's two main ways to be transgender. For some of y'all looking at the slide, you're going to be like, holy cow, this is overwhelming. And for some of y'all looking at the slide, you'll be like, wow, this is a really basic way of talking about this. So we're all meeting in the middle here, right? Um, so there's two main ways to be transgender. There's binary and non-binary transgender people. Um, additionally, just a note is you can use trans or transgender interchangeably. Those are both respectful terms to use. Um, so a binary trans or transgender person is a person that identifies within the gender binary, right? Um, so we'll talk more about that construct here in a moment, but the binary um, that we understand in the United States in 2021 is men and women, right? Those are the, the two main genders. So trans women are women and trans men are men. They, they fit into that gender binary just fine. That's affirming to them. Um, sometimes when people talk about trans folks, what I hear is, oh, my cousin is a trans woman, which means she used to be a man and now she's a woman. Try to avoid talking about trans people that way as much as possible. Um, that can be really, really painful or invalidating to that person. Trans women have always been women their whole life, right? Regardless of how they were assigned at birth or how people um, treated them growing up, right? Um, and so if you're talking about your cousin and your cousin's a trans woman, you could just say, my cousin's a trans woman, or even better, just say, my cousin is a woman, right? Um, and then when you like distill it down to that, it seems a little bit silly or like weird to like call out her gender like that, right? Um, but a lot of people tend to do that with trans folks is to say, oh yeah, they're trans, which means they used to be this and now they're that. Nothing like that. You don't need to do that. Um, uh, that can be, like I said, really invalidating. And we, we see this all the time when uh, famous people come out as trans. Um, like Elliot Page recently came out, the star of the movie Juno. And a lot of people said like Elliot Page, formerly known as XYZ page, right? And we want to avoid doing that as much as possible, right? Because that can be really, really harmful to trans folks. 
that brings us to non-binary trans people. And this is where I want to kind of point out what we talked about earlier with uh, Western colonialism, right? So uh, the gender binary, as we know it, is a colonialist construct. Um, it was uh, invented by Western colonizers. Um, and uh, it was the only reason that it has like gripped our globe the way that it has is because of Western colonialism, right? So we cannot talk about gender if we're not talking about our colonial roots and colonial uh, the genocide of, of Native people, right? So take the um, North American continent, for example. Western colonizers came to this land um, and uh, Native and Indigenous folks had many, many ways about talking about gender. There were uh, so many ways, uh, so many different ways to think about gender depending on the tribe. There's this richness and complexity in all of these different gender identities. Then Western colonizers came to this land and intentionally eradicated those gender identities, right? Right? So when I talk about non-binary people, sometimes people get really worried or freaked out and they're like, no, there's only men and women. That's what's natural, right? People like go back to that all of the time. But actually the, the gender binary is, like I said, it's a colonial construct. It's a way of oppressing people. Um, and so we have to talk about these things because they are so intertwined. Um, and, uh, you know, non-binary individuals have existed in humankind since the the dawn of humankind, right? Um, there's always been people that don't fit within a, uh, a binary gender. Um, a good example of this is Two-Spirit Native American and Indigenous American individuals. Um, Two-Spirit is a really like broad umbrella term, right? Like I said, there's this beautiful richness and complexity in Native and Indigenous um, genders here in the United States or in North America. Um, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of ways to understand gender in uh, Native culture. Um, but again, and, and non-binary people, um, two-spirit individuals have existed um, on this land for, you know, longer than most people have been here, right? So if you are challenged by the idea of people not identifying as a man or a woman, I would just challenge yourself a little bit on that, right? Like, just just sit with that a little bit and think about, you know, if you're like, wow, this is, y'all are just making up terms, this is some newfangled idea, like, what are you talking about? Really think about this this history, right? Because it's just a construct, right? The, the gender binary is just a construct, and it's one that's very oppressive at that. So, um, if you are having trouble with um, uh, thinking about non-binary identities, just sit with it a little bit and, and recognize that um, uh, non-binary people have existed for a really, really long time. And there are examples of non-binary people in every culture, um, and that could be in and of itself its own presentation. Uh, some other ways to be non-binary, there are actually dozens and dozens of non-binary identities, so keep that in mind, these are only six. Um, there's agender people, people who don't identify with any particular gender identity uh, really strictly. There's gender queer and gender fluid people, which are people whose gender identity and gender expression might shift and flow throughout time. There's poly or bi-gender people, which are people that identify as multiple genders at the same time. And then there's demigender uh, people who are people who identify with a lot of the characteristics of a binary gender, that is men and women, but they don't identify as that gender itself. So a good example is a demi-boy. Um, a demi-boy identifies with a lot of the characteristics of masculinity, but they don't identify as a man. So that's something to keep in mind. When you work with trans people, there's some things to keep in mind. So trans people can decide to transition at any age. I work with trans folks ages 10 through 75. There's no one right time to come out as trans or gay or bisexual or anything like that, right? Um, trans people may or may not change their name or their pronouns. If you're not familiar with pronouns, that's what we're going to talk about here in just one moment. So don't don't sweat it. Um, and then a lot of trans people, uh, the thing that a lot of people know about the trans community is that we might use hormones and surgery, but that is just not the case. So a lot of people may or may not use hormones and surgery. Um, remember earlier how I said the only prerequisite for identifying as a woman is to identify as a woman, or the only prerequisite to identify as non-binary is to identify as non-binary, right? Um, that's really important because a lot of the time when people come out as trans, the assumption is that they're going to use hormones and surgery, like right off the bat. Um, and the thing about that is that you don't need certain sex characteristics to be a woman, right? You don't need certain hormones to be a woman. You don't need certain surgeries to be a woman, right? So trying to, like, 
take away the habit of assuming that trans people, you know, want to use hormones or surgery as a way to like achieve their gender um, is, is really just kind of an outdated thought, right? There are a lot of trans people that may or may not use those uh, hormones and, and utilize surgeries. That doesn't make them any less of their gender identity. It just means that they experience their gender differently than other people do. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of tra uh, trans people don't have access to hormones and surgery, right? This is really, really key um, because um, uh, a lot of, like, like I said earlier, there's these huge health care disparities. So a lot of trans people are interested in hormones and surgery, but simply don't have access to them. Um, now, when you work, or when you meet transgender people, you can ask their name and use that name. It's pretty clear and, and obvious. Uh, and avoid invasive and unnecessary questions. So this relates to that, that uh, point that I just made. Um, when you meet transgender people, don't ask them if they've used hormones or surgery. Because when you do that, what you're asking them in no uncertain terms is what their genitals look like. That's not acceptable, right? If you wouldn't ask a cisgender person that question, you shouldn't ask a transgender person that question. The only time that it's okay to engage in that kind of conversation about hormones or surgery is if you're their primary care provider, or if they've come to you and said, hey, like I just started hormones, I'm really struggling, can you and I talk about it? And then that's fine. And then talking about our intersex community, um, a person, so an intersex person is a person whose biological anatomy or genes um, vary from the expected male or female genitalia, chromosomes, endocrine systems, or internal reproductive systems. Um, and then kind of talking about that. Um, so biological sex is not binary. Um, typically we group people in these categories as male or female, um, but it's super important to understand that um, these two terms are just different ways of defining the ends of the spectrum here. Um, so as we see a male, that is someone with um, an excess of testosterone. Um, but we also understand that um, someone who menstruates, uh, their hormone levels vary. Um, so they can be on one part of this spectrum, but then shift back and forth throughout this uh, spectrum. And it's also important to understand that when someone goes through puberty, this also happens. Um, so there's no simple way uh, to fit into the binary of male or female. Um, all those hormones are found in all of us. Uh, this might feel really overwhelming. This is just the chart from the Scientific American article Beyond XX and XY. Um, I highly recommend this article if you're interested in it. You can always reach out if you want more information. But this is a variety of different ways that people can be intersex uh, through conception, birth, and puberty. Um, so just think about that. Uh, intersex people make up between 0.5 and 1.5% of the population. There are a lot of different ways to be intersex. And then wrapping up everything that we've talked about thus far um, is the gender unicorn. Um, so again, highlighting gender identity, gender expression, um, our sex assigned at birth, um, which is again, a legal construct uh, there, um, talking about physical attraction and emotional attraction or sexual orientation um, can fit in that category as well. So then uh, as we move on, it's important to remember, it's not obvious, always obvious who is a part of the LGBTQ community. Um, there's no easy way to be a part of the LGBTQ community. And there's no um, determining factors of who can identify as LGBTQ. Um, it's also not okay to ask invasive questions about people's bodies, transitions, or out them against their will. Um, these are people's identities, not yours. Um, and then there is no universals. Um, some LGBTQ people uh, don't even like the terms or identifying with the LGBTQ community. So again, it's important to understand that there's no um, one story or one narrative here that we're trying to share. And then how to become more LGBT inclusive today. Um, so one, we have kind of already hit on this was mirroring language. Um, if I let you know that I am a gay man, it is then only usually okay to refer to me as a gay man. Um, never just assume that you can label someone as something unless they're labeling themselves as it. So um, if I'm using he, him pronouns, um, or I'm expressing that I'm a man, it is okay then to use those um, terms for me or identifying me. And again, you typically don't need to disclose that I'm a gay man to anyone, um, unless it's 
absolutely necessary. Um, so again, that would be going along with outing people and doing things against people's will. Um, but also avoid making assumptions. You should never just assume. Um, but then also ask and give pronouns. Again, we're going to be hitting on that here. Um, but giving your own pronouns can also be creating a safe space um, for someone who may be using different pronouns than perceived um, to express that. Uh, and then using and practicing gender neutral language. Um, this allows people to, uh, who may not be a part of the binary to feel more included. And then prepare to apologize. We're all human, correct? So it's natural that a mistake will occur every now and then. Malikai, can you give us an example of how, of how we can use, um, what was the term, um, like more inclusive, um, neutral language, gender neutral language? Yeah, we actually have a list that we're going to hit on um, probably right oh, I okay. think it's right or no, that's totally fine. It was a good question. Um, and we will be hitting on those gender neutral terms. Um, so typically, uh, like an example, if you say like a mailman, um, you're just assuming that that person identifies as a man. Um, so you should use more inclusive or gender neutral terms such as a male person, which again, we'll hit on here in a little bit. Um, but it's also important to understand that pronouns, as we're getting into this area, um, they're mandatory. They are not optional. Um, this is goes along with giving someone dignity and respect. Um, you're allowing that person to um, be a human. Uh, you're humanizing them by allow, uh, using their pronouns. Um, and then in relation to this, pronouns are also an example of personhood. Um, again, a huge part of dignity. And then you don't need to understand someone's pronouns to use them and refer to them respectfully. Um, again, just coming with respect and an openness to learn. And then how to use uh, these pronouns um, and the importance of them. A pronoun is a word used in a sentence to refer to a person without their name. So for this example, June uses she, her pronouns. June goes to the store to buy her groceries. She stops by the mall to pick up her favorite nail polish. That nail polish is now hers. Um, pronouns we often use include she, her, or he, him. However, sometimes there are people who use, um, or it's ideal to use gender neutral pronouns. So an example of this would be the singular they, them. Um, so this has two uses, it's gender neutral and it's practical. Um, so say we're at a restaurant um, and we're eating and we notice that someone has left their wallet at the table next to us. Um, I would say, oh no, someone left their wallet at the table. Somebody should turn it in for them. Um, this is grammatically correct um, and it's more practical to use um, instead of saying, oh no, someone left his or her wallet at the table. Um, someone should turn it in for him or her. Um, it's just not practical and it's not grammatically correct. Uh, so anything on that, Max? No? Perfect. Um, and then talking about common gender neutral pronouns. So for example, Andy uses they, them pronouns. Andy goes to the store to buy their groceries. They stop by the mall to pick up their favorite nail polish. That nail polish is now theirs. So that's a really good example of how they, them, their pronouns are utilized. Um, but then talking about neo-pronouns, so um, this completely throws out the idea of the binary um, because as we kind of explained, they, them still kind of includes that binary within it. So neo-pronouns such as z, 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 zier, ziers. Um, so for this example, Sid uses zier pronouns. Sid goes to the store to buy zier groceries Z stops by the mall to pick up Zer favorite nail polish. That nail polish is now Zer's. Um, again, this is a really hard idea to wrap your head around sometimes if you're new to this concept. Um, and so again, really talking about um, the importance of focusing on these, um, giving respect to these pronouns, but also uh, we'll talk about being human and messing up here in a little bit as well. So uh, because we are uh, here talking uh, with the Latino Association here in Iowa, Professional Latino Association of Iowa, um, we thought we'd include some Spanish as well. Obviously not all Latinos speak Spanish. So um, if you don't understand this, bear with me. Um, so el, ella, avi, avi, obviously uh, <laughs> these are ways that we refer typically to people in Spanish, but it's also important to understand that there are people who use ese. Además, um, it's important to understand that there's not a concrete way in Spanish um, to refer to someone in a gender neutral way. 
Um, so it's important to listen to how someone refers to themselves. Um, so for this example, Eje, Samuel usa el pronom de Eje. Samuel está yendo al mercado a comprar su abasto. Eje fue al centro a comprar su pinta unas. Eje está muy emocionada a pintar sus uñas esta noche, pero por ahora tiene que trabajar. Eje es una cartera, a post person. Um, so you can kind of see there how gender has always shaped and influenced the Western colonialism construct of the binary in our own language in Spanish. So um, when you're looking at that, uh, gender influences a lot more than just pronouns in Spanish. Um, so we have some examples there of how you can use um, gender neutral language in Spanish. But obviously, as I had mentioned, there's no simple or concrete way to do this. So where should you share your pronouns? Um, email signatures, name tag, business cards, email introductions, um, first interactions or introductions, as we kind of had mentioned, um, sharing your own pronouns creates a safe space for someone else to also share their own. Um, but then also Zoom title in this virtual world that we're living in, it's even more important to do so now. Then talking about these gender neutral terms that uh, Sonia had asked about. Um, so using terms that uh, don't target uh, a group or a gender specifically. So folks, everyone, y'all, honored guests, post person, service person, or Congress person, parent, caregiver, trusted guardian, um, sibling instead of brother or sister, child, partner, significant other, or spouse, and then also using correct anatomical terminology. So uh, not feminine body parts, but uterus, or not men's cancer screening, but prostate cancer screening. Um, because as we know, or as we have kind of already defined, um, men may have a uterus or women may have a prostate or someone outside of the binary may also have these organs. And then terminos fuera del binario del género. Um, so this again, there's no concrete way to go about this, but instead of el or la using le or una or un, une, again, this is very complicated when we get into areas such as le hermane, because we know that hermane can also be a verb. Um, so the context is super important here. Um, and then that last part there is imposible a Imposible cambiar cada palabra de español, pero es importante entender el contexto y cuando deberíamos usar estos términos. So we can't just change every word in Spanish. Obviously, we already are aware of that. Um, but it's very important to understand that the context is key. So some people may uh, truly wish for you to identify them with the, within these terms. But also, just because we're giving you these terms does not mean that someone will always be using them. Do you have a question, Sonia? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment uh, for service providers who work with the Latino community that um, we have a lot of new immigrants who come from Latin American countries where they are using um, this um, gender neutral uh, language. So it will be, um, so that is coming to, to us. It, might, it, it is not as, um, as um, talked about, um, but people who identify as queer or LGBTQ from Latin America, they know about these pronouns. So they might um, ask, ask for you to refer to them like this, or you can always ask them what their preferred pronouns are so they can tell you and feel safe. I can tell you from experience that when you, as an LGBT person, you never know who is a safe person. Um, and you know how comfortable you can feel with somebody when you're um, creating relationships or when you're networking. And when someone puts their pronouns in their signature or they ask me what my pronouns are, automatically that person becomes safer for me. Um, even though, you know, I've been in the community and I feel safe and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so it's, it's an extra level of comfort. Yeah, and I also think that it's important to hear also talk about the, that Western colonialism piece. Um, often this has like a patriarchal sense as well. Um, so if you speak Spanish or are familiar with Spanish, you know that um, if there's a group of people and there's a man or a male identifying person, we often then change um, the pronoun or the uh, the noun to 
fit a masculine sense. So todos instead of todas, um, or ellos instead of ellas. Um, so this is kind of an easier way to wrap your head around this. It takes away that part patriarchal sense um, of superiority to men and women, um, and it creates a more common ground, but also it's gender neutral. So tores or ages um, instead of ellos, uh, which again can be kind of hard to wrap your head around at first, especially if you're a native Spanish speaker. Um, but this is a very uh, important aspect. Is there another question there? Oh, I just want to say that as a as a Spanish speaker, it is really hard to change or have that, you know, change in your mind of using like Asia. So ages for me is really very hard, but I just want to point this out that even though it's hard to change that, for me, the most important thing is to treat everyone with respect. And I think uh, that is a key for uh, every human being, you know, and that is uh, most importantly, rather than, and I understand what you're trying to say about changing, um, you know, LS. Oh, it, is, it is even hard to <laughs> say it, but um, it is so hard, but respect is key in here. That I wanted to say that. Yeah, yeah. In, like, entiendo perfectamente mi papá es de la República Dominicana, like, Entiendo que la idioma es muy difícil la cambiar. And in my country, I am from Argentina, and in my country are working very hard to implement these changes. And it's really hard for me to listen and understand what they're trying to say when, when they're talking with this, uh, you know, in this way. So it is yeah, hard. Yeah. And again, I have as someone who grew up speaking Spanish, I had not encountered gender neutral language um, until actually living a little bit in Buenos Aires. Entonces, like, oh, yeah. that, that's where I encountered all of this. And that's why we think it's important to like communicate because it's not often talked about within our community. So yeah. that was a very good point. But then talking about the art of the apology, we are all human and we will all make mistakes, correct? Um, whether in Spanish or in English. So um, the apology, it's important to be sincere and authentic, um, but then also affirm the gender or pronoun, be concise with your apology and then move on. And then some things to avoid in your apology is being overly apologetic, explaining why you misgendered someone, blaming the person for misgendering them, panicking or dwelling on the mistake. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Max? Yeah, a good example of a great apology, uh, a good apology should take less than 10 seconds. So that's a really good like way of thinking about it. So let's say I misgender my boss, Courtney, and I say, oh yeah, Courtney, he and I went to a conference over the weekend, right? So I use he, him pronouns instead of she, her pronouns. Uh, and also, trust me, I, I ask her if I can uh, use her as an example. So um, so what I would do in that situation is I would say, oh my gosh, Courtney, I just realized I used the wrong pronouns for you. I know that you use she, her pronouns. I'm going to make sure that in the future, I don't make that mistake again. I apologize and move on, right? Um, sometimes when uh, people misgender other people, they like go on and on and on and apologize a bunch. And when you are apologizing, just think about the intent behind it, right? So like, why are you apologizing? Are you apologizing to take accountability for harm? Then a quick apology is all you need. But if you're apologizing because you feel really bad and you don't wanna feel really bad anymore, that's usually where we see people like overly apologize, right? So just remember um, that that person that you misgendered wants to move on just as much as you do. So make sure that you're sincere, um, keep the apology short and, and you'll be in good shape. So there's no reason to bring it back up or talk about it a lot because um, that can be really, really uncomfortable. And often when that happens, you make the person that you misgendered feel like they have to comfort you, right? They're like, oh gosh, it's okay. Don't worry about it, right? And that's the opposite of what you want, right? You're supposed to be apologizing, not the other way around. So think about that a little bit. Just make sure that your intent is true there um, and, and that good apology will fall into place. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks for having us. We've, we've got, you know, uh, we're right at time here. So um, I'll pop Malachi and Mai's um, email address here in the chat box again so that you can email us, um, ask us questions, um, whatever feels good to you. Um, we want to continue to be a resource for you.
So I just popped those yeah, into the chat thank box. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate your time and for providing this important information.